So, uh, so let me point out some uh, differences in uh, approaches between your textbook and lecture. And uh, I think those are really the circumstances where it's worth highlighting uh, because um, I'm you know, doing things differently from your textbook on purpose. And whenever I do that, I want to make sure that there is no misunderstanding that nothing in your textbook is wrong. It's just that I have different preference. <laughs> so my goal here is to highlight how um, what your textbook covers and how we cover it. Even though it's a different, it's a still um, it's getting at the same thing. Um, th there are some additional things that we do that uh, I think is beneficial for you, especially considering all the topics we covered this semester. Um, but it's, uh, I, I still recommend that you read it through the textbook because these alternate approaches are still worth looking at. So for section 4.1, uh, the what your textbook covers and what I cover, they are uh, more or less the same. There isn't a huge difference. The only thing is in the lecture, uh, for the single solid diffraction, uh, you would have to find that here uh, when I do the introduction. So the introduction part, um, I think when you watch through it and to the part where I derive the conditions for the destructive interference or, um, now oh, destructive interference or in uh, the diffraction minima. It, uh, it's the same argument you will see in the textbook. It uses a, um, a nice mathematical trick or a geometric trick. Because the thing to, I hope that you spend adequate amount of time uh, being puzzled at this is that when you're considering a single slit diffraction, um, it's like having infinite number of slits. Um, at the every point in this slit can be considered a source of wave. That's the Huygens principle. So, uh, so when you imagine analyzing them mathematically, it is quite daunting. Um, now, when you are looking for just the the diffraction minima, as in locations where these uh, locations where all the contributions to the waves will destructively interfere, there's a trick in that you can imagine dividing up this slit into pieces. Uh, you can imagine dividing it into uh, a half, uh, uh, half of the size of the slit and kind of pairing up the wavelets from different portions of the slit. One one from up here with the here, and um, you can kind of imagine that uh, pair moving through the uh, moving through the entire slit. And as it moves through, those paired uh, wavelets will cover the entire slit. And if you find the location of theta where this pair will is, interfere destructively, then you get a guarantee that all the other pairs will also destructively interfere. So that's how you find the first diffraction minima. And to find the uh, uh, higher order diffraction minima, the argument here is a bit, in some sense, sophisticated because going from here to here, it, uh, um, it, it's uh, conceptually different from how you went into higher orders of interference, uh, minima and maxima. The, the arguments for diffraction minima are different. So, and I want to just highlight that your textbook is a little bit sloppy here. Um, so this uh, bright, that's fine. That's the central maximum. And these dark fringes, they are correct. This here, it's only approximately correct. Um, when you see the derivation for the exact um, intensity expression, you can actually, you know, find the exact location for interference maxima, or sorry, diffraction maxima, and you'll find that it's not given by this simple relationship. So, um, oh, I'm gonna have to read it after the session to see if they clarify that this is only approximate. If not, then that's something that they ought to correct. So, so when we are dealing with the diffraction, we tend to talk more about the minima than the maxima. 
because getting the exact position for the minima is simpler. Um, so in order to consider this pattern more fully, what you really need is um, an expression for intensity pattern. And that's where your textbook approach will differ from the lecture approach. The treatment given your textbook, that is the standard approach. Um, you use, uh, you work it out geometrically. And if you remember working with the phasers in your physics 4B, maybe dealing with the AC circuits, then it's the same thing that they are referring to. Uh, geometrical quantity, which is used to, to refer to a phase of um, little wavelet. And um, they go through these drawings. And uh, so this uh, would be like the continuous limit of considering that phaser thing. And they go through all this to do the calculation. And I do recommend that you read through it, see if uh, uh, try to understand their argument. And having, and you know, they drive these formulas, which um, are useful to know where they are. <laughs> There's a definition of beta or quantity that they will use to specify the intensity expression. It, so it's a, such a complicated expression that they don't give it to you in a single step. <laughs> they first define a quantity beta, which uh, relates a little bit to the uh, phase and it can be stated in terms of the, the aperture size, the slit size, um, the angular position where you are considering the intensity. And um, with this parameter, you can specify the intensity. And if you work out beta, again, you can see that it's a sign of a sign of something. Um, so they have that. And, um, and I do recommend that you read it through, try to understand <laughs> this <laughs> setup. Um, and having said all that, um, in the lecture, I present a different approach. And the different approach is based on a mathematical tool, which I think you will find um, much more useful in this class. So, you know, I talk, I introduce a complex exponentials in physics 4B as well. And in physics 4B, I kind of do it, um, I do it, it's not something that I need to do. I introduce complex exponentials in physics 4B because I want to, because I think it's just such a wonderful tool that everyone who has a chance to learn about it should learn. Um, in this class though, I'm not just doing it uh, just because I want to. I do it because uh, sooner or later, it's something that you are going to need to know. When we get to quantum mechanics, if we are eventually going to talk about something called the Schrodinger equation, which is an um, equation that tells us how quantum mechanical world behaves. And a feature of this equation is that um, the time dependent Schrodinger equation is that it's a complex uh, differential equation. So when you are looking for solutions to this, there's no going away from complex functions. So when you get to here, you are going to have to deal with complex exponentials eventually already. So I'm just introducing what you need to learn later in the semester early, because I think it's a wonderful tool. And the earlier we introduce it, the more use you will get out of this wonderful tool. So, so your textbook just introduces it later. And I think when they do, they don't really tell you a lot, teach you a lot about complex exponentials. So, so that's where I would uh, ask you to um, spend some time watching through the lecture, which is only in the lecture, it's not in the textbook. So watch through the lecture. And uh, I did something unusual and uh, edited this video from my uh, last semester's of physics 4B class, because this illustrates some of the calculational tool that you have with the complex exponentials, um, which is, um, how you should be careful with nonlinear operations when you're dealing with the complex functions and how even with that limitation, as long as you are trying to calculate a time average, the quantity, you can still use complex exponentials. 
So uh, it's kind of long, but I think it's uh, uh, worth watching through so that you understand what kind of operations you are allowed to do and what kind of operations that you shouldn't do uh, when you are working with complex exponentials. That's probably the biggest uh, caution about whenever you are dealing with sophisticated mathematical tools. Because, you know, it's like working with a power tool. It's nice and wonderful, but at the same time, there's a potential for hurting yourself if something goes wrong. Complex exponentials are kind of like that. Um, so, so, yeah, so this is where you will see me. Um, so this is a calculation that your textbook actually doesn't do at all. Your textbook doesn't do any double slit uh, interference intensity calculation. So I do it, I did it last week already, and I redo it here using complex exponential. And I hope the length here shows you how much um, simpler the calculation is when you use complex exponentials. What I maybe wanted to do if I had the time, but I think I may be out of time is, so when you look at this calculation, I noticed it as I was editing through it. Um, so most of the calculation goes well. Um, you see me set up the, um, you know, this uh, setup and th this time it's a general setup. So I'm not just looking for in diffraction minima and looking for um, convenient mathematical uh, tricks. Uh, I have a need to actually express the net electric field in terms of um, electric field contribution from all the different points in the slit. And I go, and this kind of integral, that's uh, the thing that's uh, difficult to do, do when you are using the geometric uh, representation. That's why your textbook doesn't actually represent what they do as a kind of integral. Because when you think through conceptually, it is. When you look at the uh, diffraction intensity, um, you can kind of see how this is like an integral of this. Because here, what they're doing is adding finite size to contribution. And you imagine each contribution becoming infinitesimally small, but the, the, you increase the total number of contributions. So it becomes a smooth curve. That's integral. <laughs> but um, to describe this as geometric thing as integral, it gets uh, complicated. So your textbook doesn't do that, just uh, keeps using geometry. Uh, with a complex exponential, what we can do is we can represent that integral as an integral and actually do the integral. And I think in this lecture video, I go as far as actually doing the integral and plugging in the limits. I think the only thing I uh, didn't have time to finish doing was calculating the, um, was um, taking the absolute value square of this, doing this calculation to come up with an expression for intensity. Um, I thought I might do it today, but I, I think uh, with everything, I'm kind of out of time. Um, I encourage you to try it out on your own. <laughs> and uh, if an opportunity comes up, I'll think about if there's a good time for me to actually show you that derivation. It, it's not that long. It's like two, three minute calculation, but uh, I, it's 702 and it's holiday. So I think I'll leave that for your exercise. Unless there are requests from people, if it's something that you want to see me do, then let me know and I'll, I can definitely find time to do that if there's demand for it.